today we want to talk about supply chain security for open source projects in, in the main topic, but uh, a lot of stuff is for closed source projects as well. I will highlight where is the difference in all this stuff. And um, what I want to go through, I want to go through a little bit in the past what's happened, uh, not in all details, but just to to come to a point where we see, okay, what, what is going on, what's changing, especially during the last three years, a lot of stuff changed and there's a big change since eight, nine months. I think you know what I mean. Yeah, so this funny stuff that's going in the East and um, there's a lot of stuff ongoing we should be aware of. Then I want to um, go through uh, some technical details, some stuff you need in your daily job as software developer. And yeah, so we'll see. It's it's uh, the big thing. Yeah, as mentioned, my name is Sven. As you can see, I'm mostly out in the woods every three minutes. I'm out in the woods. So if you want to see me out in the woods talking about cybersecurity stuff, go to my YouTube channel, Sven Rupert, in English, not in German. Subtitles are crap. And uh, I really would like to have you a subscriber of my pet project. It's a tiny, tiny channel, but uh, I love it. So uh, yeah, this is, if you want to reach me, don't use email, okay? It's just not working. Use Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, but no email. It's really not working. I'm getting too many emails. I'm deleting too fast. It's it's a mess. Okay. So, by the way, if someone of you want to have this cool shirt, not exactly this one, but a similar one, then go to this link. And the five first one that are registering will get a book as well. It will be delivered by mail. And yeah, feel free to share it a little bit with your colleagues that are not able to attend today. So maybe tomorrow is a good chance to register for a shirt. And yeah, that is more or less, yeah. Yeah, the shirt and the DevOps tool. By the way, the security chapter was from me in this book. Um, okay, so far, who knows what JFrog is doing, by the way? Art Factory? Someone's playing around with Art Factory? Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. But, so every everybody has this link, right? Otherwise, I'm sharing it later, don't worry. So, back to the topic. Excuse me? European or American size? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first time I'm getting this question. Uh, not normally we try to uh, yeah localize sizes. <laughs> okay, so um, otherwise, just um, if something with the size is not correct, or so I think there's there's a way to to deal with this. Uh, yes, but I will mention it so that we are so we are collecting this as well. Um, okay, so where it starts, I think the most of you heard about the SolarWindSec. Yes, SolarWindSec. Someone heard about it? Okay, who, who know nothing about the solar wind tech? Okay. The following happened. There's a company, SolarWinds. They're producing a software, it's called Orion Platform, and this Orion Platform is used to measure and configure and to administrate networks, okay? So it's a, it's a very prominent part in your infrastructure if you're using it because it has the right to, to scan everything, to manipulate the network infrastructure and so on and so on. Okay. So customers that are using this one, they're not managing one single server, they're just, uh, managing networks. So we are talking about a bunch of servers, not only one. Okay. And they have approximately, I think, 300,000 customers or so worldwide, all the big names, no? military, space, defense, governmental, whatever. All the big things. So there, there was a group that um, broke into the company called FireEye. FireEye is normally a security company that try to break into other, so why takers break into other company networks and giving you a report and all this stuff. And uh, they have a good tool set and the hacker group broke into FireEye networks, stole this tool stack and with this tool stack, they went to uh, SolarWinds and broke into their network. So what have they done? They they haven't stolen anything. They are not using ransomware, whatever. They went to the CI environment of this company because they're producing software, okay? And then they changed the CI environment in a way that with every new build, the binary was compromised. It was 
not working in a way it should be. So some extra functionality was included. Okay. And then this company with 300,000 customers have an automatic software update mechanism for all their customers. And it took, I don't know, two, three, five days and they infected 12,000, 15,000 customers means networks. This was a big thing. Okay. And all mechanisms like, oh, there's a company, they give me a fingerprint of a binary, I'm comparing it, oh, and trust this company and installing it, it's not working. Not good, huh? So the main thing here, what I mentioned is, we as software developers, we have now to be sure that we are not only consuming malicious or vulnerable stuff, we have to make sure that we are not distributing it. Because this hacker group broke into the supply chain, used a big multiplicator, this company, yeah, and affected or infected a bunch of different networks. And this was a huge thing that even the US government changed the way they're operating IT. Yeah. So we have to make sure as software developer that we are not consuming this stuff and we have to make sure that we are not distributing this stuff. And who of you checked once his CI environment for vulnerabilities? Anybody of you? Huh? One? Who, who checked his Jenkins Docker image file uh, and hardened it after this, not only checking. Uh, so this is something that is changing. So and some key factors around the supply chain. Supply chain itself is a big thing. It means from the idea until something's running at production of all industries, automotive, space, military, defense, healthcare, whatever. Okay, it's a very generic thing, supply chain. Uh, and supply chain security means it's a whole thing should be protected. And a few things changed during the last few years, especially during the time we all went uh, to, yeah, to work at home, remote. We opened our networks, we use more cloud infrastructure, bring your own device stuff and so on and so on. And what we can see is that, for example, uh, compromise in geopolitics or geopolitics in general is influencing the way attacks are going on, especially during the last few months. If you're working for an SMB company with say 10 developers and you were flying under the radar since the last 20 years, nobody was interested in you. Now maybe you are targeted because you are delivering something to an unfriendly company that is delivering to an unfriendly uh, country. Okay. And that means that you're not targeted by single individuals, you're targeted by governmental supported infrastructure or supported groups, especially from the East. Okay, that is not fun anymore. And uh, just to highlight a few words, my brother is working in cybersecurity for a different company and uh, what they are detecting since this date is amazing, the amount of attacks. Okay, so criminals. Uh, Earlier days, you had one genius guy that was able to find a zero day and was hacking something. Okay. Now they have groups and these groups are not working isolated. These groups are working together. They're sharing information. They're sharing resources. They're sharing even hats. Okay. So they are working more and more structured globally together. Sometimes it's good for us if you are. Looking on our side, Anonymous was very active in the beginning, uh, after it starts in the East, but there's no control. They're doing what they want, okay? And we saw what they were able to do, just as mentioning, they broke into Russian television and changed the program, okay? That's not a tiny thing. Expanding motives of ransomware. Uh, longer time ago, I heard quite often, oh, this part of the supply chain has a value of, let's say, $1 million. So everything that is uh, more cost intensive than $1 million makes no sense because we are just buying it new. And everything below, we are just paying. If ransomware there, then we are just buying some Bitcoins, sending the money, done. It's not working because more and more ransomware is used on a political strategy. It means they're collecting your money, but they have no interest in doing something. Okay. Improved ecosystem hygiene is pushing threats to left and right means during the pandemic, a lot of big companies started to increase the barriers. They invested in firewalls, um, Rust tools, runtime application security protection tools. They are invested in human resources and so on and so on. So they ramped up their security. And that means that all the companies left and right of the supply chain, they are not able to follow. 
They just don't have money, hats, and so on. Okay. That means that these companies are more and more targeted because the main targets, the big companies, are too hard to get in. And even the cyber criminals are thinking economy wise, where is the weakest part? And it means companies that are under the radar for a long, long time are now targeted because there is a weak part in the supply chain. I'm not covering here hardware vulnerabilities, but they're still there. What I'm saying about software applies for hardware as well. Compromised hardware, nice cheap hardware that is delivered to data centers coming from somewhere around the globe with some extra functionality on board, okay? We found this quite often. The other thing is vulnerabilities, uh, bugs in hardware. So if you are in cloud, make sure that you think about how long you're storing data unencrypted in memory, because you have no clue who is able to read it. Even if you're in a cloud instance that you're not hosting or where you're not exclusively on, because some other customers can do things, okay? If you're not talking about private cloud. So, but this we are not covering, but have in mind, hardware is full of vulnerabilities as well. So why supply chain security attacks against zero days? Zero days are quite freaky hard to find because you need to find something that is not known so far. A zero day is a vulnerability that is just not known. It's not part of the vulnerability databases. There's no patch, there's nothing, okay? This is a zero day. For this, to find this, even if you're using technologies like fuzzing, for example, is one of the common strategies to identify zero days, you need a bunch of resources or you must be quite deep into this stuff. So the technical barrier is quite high. Way easier is to attack with non-vulnerabilities or malicious packages, the supply chain and using multiplicators. This can be done even by kids. And this is why supply chain attacks are more and more coming because it's cheap to do compared to zero days. Zero day, what do you think? What, what is Zerodium, for example, this is place where you can sell zero days? What they're paying? How much money they're paying for a zero day? 100K. One million. One. Up to one million. Okay, and these are official numbers that are not so unofficial numbers. I think if you are talking to a governmental institution that is very keen of having the zero day, they are willing to do a lot. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, that's one thing. <clears throat> and what what we have, especially if you have this trusted networks, you are you are trusting this company and you are grabbing this. It's not good anymore. So we have to think globally in a zero trust environment behavior, okay? Trust nobody. Even if you have a re uh, business relationship over years, don't trust, okay? It is exactly the point. So this picture is stolen from an open source project called Salsa. I'm going back to this a little bit later. Um, but what I want to mention here, if we have this global supply chain stuff, now I'm narrowing it down to software supply chain security, okay? Just what we are doing on a daily basis. And if you are looking at this one here, okay, we, we have a concept, then we start coding stuff. What we are producing? Source code, okay? With this source code, what can happen? Okay, you can have malicious commits or whatever, working with code reviews against it, whatever. Source code, okay? This source code is then pushed to some kind of Git repository. And this is infrastructure. And the biggest question in the beginning is, are you able to host this stuff by yourself? Yes or no? Are you able to harden it? Are you able to scale? Are you able to maintain it in a way that it's not the weak part in your infrastructure? So this is a strategic decision you have to do inside your company or inside your team, and then make the decision, host by myself, and invest in all this stuff? Well, someone should host it, hopefully better than you. Okay, that's mostly the target. But this is infrastructure. From this Git repository, mostly it's going to some built infrastructure. You see, source threads is everything that try to compromise the source code itself. Everything that's following up, it's called build threads. Because we are to uh, talking now about how to manipulate uh, binaries. The only thing is if you're sneaking by source code from external resource, it's it's a build thread because part of the build process, but still manipulation on source code, but just a tiny thing. So we have this CI environment. This is infrastructure. And again, are you able to host it by yourself? Are you able to harden it? What's the right strategy? Blah, blah, blah. 
This is producing binaries and pushing to something like an um, artifactory and repository where the binaries are stored or is consuming binaries because during the build process you need binaries, okay? So in the end, what we have, very simply speaking, is three things as software developers. Source code, binaries, infrastructure. Infrastructure is mostly a static decision. We are doing it by ourselves, we are taking service or whatever. This is nothing what you're changing every day. But what you're changing every day is source code and binaries, okay? So if you start thinking about what you, especially everybody of you, can influence on a daily basis is source code and binaries. Think about this one, okay? I'm coming back to, to this project later. Um, <clears throat> If you start reading about security stuff, who's involved in security process in the company in this project? Defining or using? Yeah, part of some, something to do with security already. Okay. If you start reading about this stuff, you will find out that they're coming quite fast. It's four main areas. The first is thus static application security testing means you have some vulnerability scanner or scanners in general that are able to scan everything, configuration, binary, source code, and so on and so on. This can be done quite early in the production line because nothing must be able to run. Yeah? If you're writing the first line of code, you can scan it. That's it. If you're writing the first line of dependency configuration, you can scan it. Okay, that's it. And it means that you can do it over the whole supply chain, over the whole production line, and you can scan 100% of all elements, everything. Everything you're getting, you can scan. Static application security testing. The next one is the opposite. It's who is constantly pinging. The opposite is dynamic application security testing. Means you must be able to ramp up an application, and then this application will be you're looking from outside with this hacker approach and then with most common vulnerabilities you come to and try to, to break in, okay? So SQL injection or whatever. Mostly you're using a tool, a cloud provider, or whatever. And that means that for dust dynamic application security testing, something must run already. So it's quite late in the production line. And then you need resources to scale dust as a dynamic application security testing, to have the half amount of time, it needs a double amount of resources because something must run with a double speed. If you want to scale with a service provider, you need a double amount of bandwidth because mostly these tools are cloud providers or cloud tools. The next thing is that mostly these tools are working over the most common vulnerabilities plus fuzzing to make some random stuff Okay, but mostly you have no access to define the attack vector by yourself. And even if you know what attack vector you want to have, you must be able to define it and you need the knowledge to do it. Okay. If you're combining both, you're coming to this interactive application security testing. This is something that you can see like um, security debugging. You're ramping up the application, you're looking inside, you're defining an attack vector, you're tweaking some stuff, you're changing a little bit, okay? This is interactive application security testing. Very, very good, but you need high-skilled people. If you start learning security and after two years you're doing the first interactive, interactive application security testing, don't trust your results, okay? It will take some more time. And this is not scaling. To have the double amount of tested systems you need, double amount of heads or the double amount of time. So scaling is an issue here. The next one is runtime application security protection. As I mentioned, uh, as you can hear in the name, it's not testing anymore because runtime application security protection is an agent-based approach. In some environments, not allowed to use agent-based approach. It's something like APM tools. Yeah, You have an agent that is monitoring the bytecode with additional information, some, some kind of logging. And then on the productive system, you're getting all these logs. And in real time, you try to identify with machine learning approaches if there is an ongoing attack, known or unknown. doesn't matter. There is an ongoing attack. It means it's the last wall of defense. It makes no sense to do this on tests or staging or whatever, because there is no ongoing attack. And it's just the last wall of defense on production and mostly it costs a bit money, okay? Should you trust only Rasp? No, definitely not, because you just have the choice to monitor and alert something or shutting down because there is an ongoing attack if this tool is identifying something. 
Can you start with IS? Definitely not, because you need very high skilled people and it's mostly not scaling enough. For individual things, yes, but in masses, you're not able to do this, this approach. Dust, well, this is a very good thing inside the CI environment, but it's time consuming, uses a lot of resources, and it's quite late inside the production lane because something must run already. And with dynamic application security testing, you can't test everything. With Dust, you can scan every component. With Dust, you can just test the wrapper and then indirectly the rest of the system. Okay, that's it. With Dust, it's very easy because everybody can do it on his laptop. Okay, you need no knowledge. You just need to scan and say, give me the list of malicious packages, vulnerabilities. I will explain what the difference is and all this stuff. Okay, and it's freaking fast because it's scanning binaries. Okay, you can address a lot of stuff out of the dynamic context if you're scanning configurations, all this stuff. But you're missing a little bit of the dynamic context, what you would get with Dust. So my personal opinion is start with Dust because everybody can start immediately with this. We'll get a list of vulnerabilities and then you can work against it. Then if you're later in the production line and you have more money and resources, then start using Dust, this dynamic application security testing approach on staging systems or whatever to harden it again and to have a different view. But mostly IST is something that just a few companies are really investing in and RASP, well, it's a decision, an additional thing. Okay. So this is more or less what you, what you will hear, but what is good for a machine? What's bad for a machine? What, what can a machine do good? I'm using cloud native ex excuse. It's exactly working for me microservices, functions, monoliths, I don't care, okay? It's just an excuse to have something here. If you have use cases and you want to split them in two different or in a bunch of different microservices, is a machine good enough to decide how to split this use case or microservice? Can the machine help you? No. Can the machine decide what use case should be separated to make it more secure? No. The machine is just not able to do it right now, maybe in 10 years, but right now, no. This is something a human should be do. And domain specific things is something a human should be do. Huh? It's nothing what a machine is good in. If you're talking about the communication layer, a little bit lower in the technical layer, now these different microservices are communicating. So the machine is very good in handshaking, encrypting channels and all this stuff. The machine is crap. If you have to decide if it is secure to send this to values over the same why or should I use different channels? Stuff like this. Machine is not good. They are not able to identify it. Okay. We're going to the container-based infrastructure. Now we have this Kubernetes nodes and all this stuff. The machine are better and better and better because now they can introduce uh, resilience patterns and circuit break and all this stuff. Huh? Respawning nodes, ramping up version, ramping down version. That's good. The machine is good there. Okay. But the machines are really, really good in the whole DevOps space. Yeah, because here they have the most power because there's the biggest technical thing they can influence. But if you are looking now only in one application, we have two dimensions, domain specific things and technical things. Again, domain specific things. Can this process be compromised? Can I get more money out as bringing in or stuff like this? The machine is not able to identify. But technical things, the machines are good. With every layer you're adding, you are just able to add zero or more vulnerabilities. You can't remove vulnerabilities per definition. Okay. You can make them unaccessible. That's one thing, but you can't remove them. Okay. So per definition, with every layer, you can just add more vulnerabilities. Same, by the way, with compliance things. Yeah. If something here is a bad license, you can't hide it. On the other thing, the most people are forgetting their own DevOps space. So it means, have you checked your compiler? Have you checked your CI environment? Have you checked your own scripts and all this stuff? Mostly not. If you want to read a little bit, uh, check out there is a nice article about the Evil compiler. It's an old article, but it's a nice one. The Evil compiler. Yeah, it's, it's a nice article. But the main thing, what is part of release? If you want to make things and secure, not really secure, but if you want to be able to respawn the whole environment, you don't need just the binaries that you produce, but you need the tool stack as well. So mostly for release, 
if you really want to have release, you need the binaries, the source code, the IDE, the corresponding JVM, and all this stuff, your scripts, and so on. That would be a full release so that you really can ramp up the whole situation again. But this is what the most people are forgetting. So harden your own tech stack. If you're reading a little bit more, you will find something like shift left. It means try to start with security as early as possible. Okay? Shifting it as left as possible. If you're talking about the full stack, whatever application I'm creating, I have an application and then I have source code and binaries. Okay? Infrastructure is managed outside. We have just source code and binaries. If I have source code, this is what I'm writing by myself. And then I have these binaries. And these binaries are mostly organized in a way of dependency management systems. Group ID, artifact ID, version, whatever. Different strategies on different levels. But if you're going to an application, maybe Java, you have some Maven repositories to deal with all this external stuff. On Linux, maybe Debian, Docker, even starts with a from statement, yeah? Kubernetes. But the most people are not dealing with their own tool stack. Think about your tool stack like a generic repository. If you're dealing with Artifactory, create a generic repository with your own layout, a few clicks, then you can put in your IDE, your JVM you're using, and so on. Why not including this in your release? Okay? And this few gigabytes are just tiny compared to what you're storing anyway in this whole stuff. Okay? So, all the applications plus the binaries you're using for production, okay? Think about in repositories to have access because you want to have it from outside, you want to manage by yourself and so on. This is this management, okay? So at Drayfrog, we have this art factory. They are organizing all these uh, repositories. And what is a good point to start here with security scanning? Because you have access to all the metadata. If I'm scanning just a binary and looking at it, then I have no clue about Dependencies, transitive dependencies in compile scope, test scope, statically linked, dynamically linked, whatever. All this meta information is available. So it makes sense to start somewhere where the repository is with the knowledge of all the metadata plus the access to all binaries of the whole tech stack to start there with security. Because it makes no sense to check here for a vulnerability if I don't know what is the operating system it's running in because I need a full impact graph. That's the only thing that's interesting later. Huh? So comparing, now people saying, okay, if I had just source code and binaries, and then I see quite often that they start scanning the source code with machine learning and huge amount and doing a lot of stuff. But if you're comparing how much source code you're creating by yourself compared to the lines you're adding via dependencies, mostly the dependencies are, I don't know how much more, okay? That's the thing. You have a few hundred thousand lines of code, but the dependencies are way more. In the kernel, it's even worse. A little bit of configuration and millions or I don't know how much. And again, the binaries you have here. So what should you focus on? Source code or binaries? The first thing you should focus on is binaries because it's the most dominant thing in the whole tech stack of the whole tech layer. It's 99% of the stuff you're doing mostly. Okay. Same. By the way, who is using Twitter? Twitter? Twitter. Or LinkedIn? LinkedIn? Okay, do me a favor. I'm here on the Spanish tour, okay? And what I see in every community is that they have a long history, but they are starting more or less from scratch since the pandemic. And the bad thing, what you can give back to them, the organizers, is that you start tweeting about it and making some noise on Twitter. So do me a favor, make a picture, writing something, sharing it and pushing in the jack, maybe the jack of the next one or some other Spanish jack, if you would, a JFrog would be nice because then they are sharing it as well. But help them to make some noise so that they are attracting more people again. Okay? So that they know, okay, there is something going on. That is what you can give back for pizza and all this stuff to help him. So if you are talking about this stuff, compliance and vulnerabilities. Compliance is more or less the same like um, I have the wrong license somewhere, okay? The first thing what someone needs to do is to define what's a good, what's a bad license. For this, you need a lawyer once. If this is defined, you can work with this. The machines can scan. If you work with Java EE, then it was Jakarta EE, then it was Eclipse EE, and now it's, what's now? What, whatever EE, no? it's, it's something EE. So even in the specs, you had the change of license, okay? 
Um, the same, if, if I'm coding something, okay, and I'm using dependencies and I decide I want to switch from Jakarta Commons Lang to Google Guava, then I'm doing it. But for every project that is using my dependency, it could be an impact. So it makes sense to check the license over the whole dependency tree. It's some kind of security business-wise, okay? On the other side, vulnerabilities, to scan for vulnerabilities, it's easy. Nobody has to do something in the beginning. Just use a tool, start scanning. You know there's a vulnerability and then make sure that you're getting rid of it, okay? The main thing here is that the behavior is different. If you're talking on compliance issue, but for malicious packages, it's the same. I have somewhere a license that is not good. What should I do to get rid of this challenge? I have to replace this partner. I have to take it out and I have to find a semantic equal implementation and put it back. How easy it is to find a semantic equal implementation for a PDF creating library. Forget it. Okay. So it means you're adding something new and you have this ugly wrap around so that you're not writing everything by yourself. Okay. This is happening if you have identified malicious packages or a compliance issue. But it's a single dot. With vulnerabilities, it's a little bit different. Vulnerabilities are in different parts of the tech layer and they will be combined to different attack vectors. And only this makes sense. If I know about a vulnerability inside my application and I have no clue about the rest or the stuff around, I don't know enough about remediation mitigation information. So I have no clue if this vulnerability is important for me, yes or no. Okay, you have a bunch of false positives. And this is burning time and money. So you need the vulnerabilities of all tech layers. And then the combination of the active usable attack vectors is exactly what you need. So it makes no sense just to scan my Maven or just to scan this one. You have to scan the whole package in different stages. But in the end, you have to create the whole attack vector or all positive uh, possible attack vectors to identify which is really the vulnerability you have to fight against, okay? Um, I'm not going into the details of the lifeline of a vulnerability. I have a talk here on my YouTube channel explaining the lifeline of a vulnerability and what are the stages where you can actually do something and at what stage you can do nothing, okay? The short meaning is, if the information is consumable by you, however, Mostly, if you're using free tools, then you get the information mostly a little bit slower, if you like it or not. Huh? If you're paying for it, mostly you're getting more or faster information. This is exactly what we're doing, for example. Which one is the best vulnerability database I should use? The question is wrong. Because if I have a vulnerability at zero day, there's pure money. And now you have a vulnerability database and you, okay? And now I have here my vulnerability. I'm going, huh? how much money you are paying for me? You're saying something. Then, hey, how much you are paying for me? Huh? To whom I will sell it? Mostly to the guy that is paying more. Next day, I'm coming with the next vulnerability. And again, I'm asking you, and I'm asking you, maybe now he is paying more. To whom I'm selling this vulnerability? Most likely to him, okay? Because we are talking a lot of money. So what is the right vulnerability database? A single vulnerability database makes no sense because we have only just a subset. I need a superset. I need a superset of vulnerability database. And it's exactly what we are doing with our research team. We have all this free, we have the um, NVD and all this commercial. We are grabbing them together. And then our research team, we have a bunch of security research researchers. They're bringing this in a big superset, okay, and enriching this data. And this is a strategy. Whatever you're choosing, make sure that you're not going to a single vulnerability database because there is a lack of information. And this is just based on economics. Right? So we have vulnerabilities and malicious components, and there's a big difference. Vulnerabilities are bugs, intentionally or unintentionally. What can you do against vulnerabilities in your own source code? You have to follow the secure coding practices huh? to identify or to avoid stuff like this. How to deal with file I.O., how to do this and that. No? Okay, I have a text input field. I'm just grabbing this one, mixing it in my SQL statement and pumping it to the database. Great idea. Hmm? So this is what you're doing on your side, secure coding principles. Yeah. 
so that you're learning about this one and try to avoid it. Otherwise, the intentional is that you have in open source components commits and people want to try and add features or bug requests, fix and all this stuff. And it's not only that a single merge request, an official done merge request is maybe the vulnerability, they're starting going over fragmented attacks. This guy is here something, is the next one is doing here something, but the whole picture will give the dangerous path, okay? Not the single commit any, because this will be identified too fast by, by code reviews. But malicious components are components that are completely with different functionality inside. It's not a bug, it's really a functionality that's added in, okay? The big difference is vulnerabilities will get the CVEs, the Common Vulnerability Identifier. That's an ID of the vulnerability. And if you have this number, you can just copy paste it, push it to Google, and you will get a bunch of information. With malicious components, there is no database like this. Just our research team found, I think, 14 or 15,000 malicious NPM packages. Okay, so we are talking about a huge thing. It's nothing small, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what, what we are doing. So now I'm, I'm a software developer. Now I need a little bit more the understandings what are infection methods and what are obfuscating techniques. I'm just scratching on top a little bit because we don't have enough time, but I want to highlight a few of this. Typo squatting. You are adding a dependency and then you had your first or sixth coffee in the morning. What will happen? You are a little bit fast on that keyboard, okay? So you're typing Google with three O's or Jakarta Commons Lang with three M's or whatever. You have a typo in your dependency definition. So what's going on? I try to guess what are typical typos. Then I'm grabbing this open source component, the source code, adding my stuff, what I want to have added, repackaging this stuff with this typo and pushing this to Maven Central. Oops, now someone has this type in the dependency definition. The request is going to the local repository. Mm, I don't know. Okay, go to your father. The father says, oh, mm, yeah, maybe uh, mm, I can ask Maven Central. Maven Central will say, yeah, I have it. Because no, with the typo, but the same version. You're grabbing now this external dependency in a way that you're not able to identify because the IDE is not complaining, the build is not breaking, and the functionality is not breaking because it's the same source code, but it's slightly different additional functionality. That's an attack that is going on endless, okay? Another thing is masquerading. Masquerading is they try to influence you in a way that you're deciding by yourself at this dependency. So they're faking the whole project. They're copying and pasting something with a long history, with good documentation, giving a slightly different name, and then you have a README and you have a long version history and blah, blah, blah. The only thing sometimes in official repositories, you see that the history and the usage is not matching, okay? But you have to have an eye on it, okay? Here's a difference between uh, this marked and marked JS, and then you have exactly the same name here, the project name is slightly different, okay? You have the original metadata copied. Then you have here slightly different GitHub. Sometimes they are using exactly the same, sometimes they are just using it, but you see a difference in metadata, okay? But on the first view, if you're on a hurry and you're searching for functionality, it's more likely that, that you're mixing it up, okay? This is masquerading. They try to fake an existing long history thing yeah? and switch and marked and marked JS. Even if the original repository is the same, yeah? you're done. Okay, you really have to check in detail what's going on. This is masquerading. Roy and package. Well, as it was in the history, someone's creating a very nice utility, sending it for free, and there's additional functionality. And there was a very nice thing. There was a hacker that provided a library to, uh, to steal Discord tokens, provided in the darknet everywhere where all these people are searching for this stuff, and they used it, and they loved it, and it works well. And they were attacking Discord servers. But there was a tiny functionality that every token that was stolen, not only delivered to the guy who's using the library, but additionally, to the inventor of this library, okay? A supply chain attack between hackers. Pensy confusion, that's nice. 
if you're working in a bigger company or whatever company, you have company internal dependencies. Yes, you have artifact and group ID and version, whatever. Then you're packing stuff. Maybe employees are leaving. They have this in mind what's going on, the artifact and group ID, version ID, maybe. But you're providing Docker image sending to a customer. And inside this Docker image is a runtime environment plus a web archive, maybe. And then you're going to this web archive extracting all the jars. If you have to fulfill this SBOM, the software builds up material, it's sometimes required already, then you have even a complete list of dependencies. It's free on a plate, just for you, okay? No reverse engineering needed. Then you're going to this Docker image and extracting this jar. And then on bytecode base, you can manipulate this stuff, yes? With this manipulated jar, with the same group and artifact ID, but with a slightly higher version number, I'm going to Maven Central and pushing this company internal dependency exactly to Maven Central. I mean, yeah, I can register every name. If you as a company are too stupid to register your name, then someone else will do it. It happened with all the big companies, definitely. And it's going on. You see it constantly. So once I have registered my company or the name of on Maven company. Central, it's okay, but maybe there is the same attack on a mirror, on a Zeitling, on ah, a different one. We have different, you have okay. different ways okay. to sneak in. But the basic idea is, oh, there's this company internal dependency from my colleague. Hey, he's a freaking cool guy. Do we have a new version? Wow, 1.6, freaking cool. I'm downloading it. So now you're going to the internal repository. The repository would say, oh, 1.6, I have no clue. Ask my father. Okay, going to the father, maybe inside the company. Do I have this component? Uh, no. Uh, let's ask Maven Central. Maven Central will say, yes, here, with a new version. And now you have compromised binary sneaking in from external resource in your internal caching strategy. Okay, so it means that can stay there for a long, long time. And then if you have version number 15151 and the next would be 16, maybe nobody will identify that 151 is compromised and will stay there forever. That's actually an interesting riff on that, which is shading. Because you, if you manage to get com.google somewhere, yep. com.google got shaded, and now you can have shaded Netty, you can have shaded Jackson, you can have everything, you can get all the popular versions of this. So there, there are a lot of different resources you can use, but it's sometimes way easier to do it. By the way, who of you scanned his only this uh, your own .m2 folder if the binaries are not compromised on your own laptop? I've done this joke once with a colleague of mine, okay, because he not closed his laptop quite fast enough. So I just sneaked in with something in his cache, cache poisoning. Nice. Make sure that every build agent is really killed after every build, okay? So what can you do against this? You have to make sure that your repository is um, dealing with um, resolution prioritization, yeah? So um, it means you have the internal dependency that is inside your artifactory or inside your repository. And if you're requesting this one, it will be just resolved internally and not ask outside, okay? Priority resolution is a feature in Artifactory for this, exactly for this thing. Or you have to deal with um, exclusion patterns on higher level uh, remote cache um, repositories. Whatever strategy, make sure that all the company internal dependencies are just resolved company internally. Okay. Okay, then hijacking. Hijacking is quite famous these days. There are different way, uh, ways of hijacking. One is, for example, I'm a maintainer of a popular open source project. I'm using Gmail for everything, for no, single sign on and authorization. And then someone is grabbing my email address and then authorization on, on all this GitHub and whatever social media stuff. What will happen? The guy will kick me out of my social media. Then I have no channel to inform my community anymore. Then we grab my source code and all this stuff, compromise, make new release and publish it. And I have no chance to say to my community, something is going wrong. Okay. That is a text over social media and all this stuff. Huh? The second one is hijacking by trust. There are a bunch of well-known open source projects. And if they are stable somehow, then the interest is losing and you are losing committers, for example. And then someone is offering to make a bug fix and all this over half a year or so. And then the maintainer will say, oh, yeah, I have no time. Here, take it, huh? do something. Done. 
then immediately the original one is kicked out of the project, try to do something. The other thing is if you are, um, have a list of maintainers and you have this domain or subdomain takeover text, it means someone has his my fancy name at mydomain.com. No? And then after a few years, he is not interested, he just let this domain go. Someone else is buying this domain because it's in this maintainer list, ramping up an email server, start authorization against his own server and is committed of this project again. Oops. And the last one I want to mention is hijacking yourself. There is a very prominent example. Someone had a library that is doing something. And then after Russia invaded in Ukraine, he decided that his own library shouldn't work on Belarus or Russian PCs and is doing crazy shit. And this was a big one. And then in a day, zoop, funny things happened. Okay, this is called protest wear. Uh, hijacking yourself. Yeah, it's especially there it happened. So there was this, um, I think it, it's a UI parser gel or whatever. It was really an, 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 an library that uh, I have to check the, the name that I'm not blaming someone else, but it was exactly in the way that on Russian and Belarus uh, PCs, it, it was going crazy, burning CPU cycles, not working. And uh, he has done it on his political motivation, but it, in this case, we say it's good. The other side says it's bad, but it's a political based thing. There is no economy interest, nothing in. And then people are using their own infrastructure and their own project to do something based on political whatever. And this could be in all directions. Okay. And it's called protest ways, hijacking your own project. Yeah, it's exactly here. Yeah, this faking colors. So protest way. No, yeah. This. No, note, note IPC. This was a project I, I was searching for. Okay. So, so what are common payloads? What people want to bring in with malicious code packages? For example, here this credit card stealers in browsers. Everybody knows it. Discord uh, user token I mentioned already. But environment variables and all this stuff. This is something that most people are not aware of or not sensitive enough. So, if I'm able to check in the, inside my instance or environment, what environment variables like AWS underscore whatever is in. What can I do with this? I can burn money. I can use it for crypto mining or whatever. I can do a lot of stuff. Expensive. So make sure that you're narrowing down the scope of environment variables and hold stuff unencrypted in memory just for the amount of time you really, really need it. Okay. And make sure that you're working against it, have an eye on it, right? If you're using, for example, this build information that you can store in Artifactory, then you can check their diff between builds to see if there's different environment variables and all this stuff, yeah? Then download and execute. Okay, connect back shell is something like, I'm asking my master, what should I do and give him the results? Then I'm asking for the next, like in remote terminal. And crypto miner is something that is very common because people want to burn your CPU cycles to get Bitcoins. No? But as a software developer, I have to deal with source code as well. I just want to highlight a few obfuscating techniques so that you're aware of what is going on in source code. If I trust the research of a German security department, um, here's this IT security department, a lot of attacks are coming from inside of the company, from people that are not happy with their working space or they're leaving the company or they are not promoted or whatever, okay? As well as external. Obfuscating techniques. For example, very obvious thing is that you're using obfuscating techniques to make reverse engineering a little bit harder. You should think about it to prevent, for example, this dependency confusion attack, huh? that you are obfuscating your own code before you're making bytecode and sending it out. But on the other side, you will see this quite fast if you're using a traditional one, because it's more or less this obfuscator, they try to encode, for example, in hex strings, then it's hard for you to read, okay? And in the end, you have a curl request or you have a post request or you have whatever. You have no idea what this payload is, okay? So you have to decompose this, even if you see this hex encoded stuff, it's always a base 64, it's, it's always suspicious. Another thing is control, control flow flattening. It means, and good advice if that logical branches are just 
as long as your screen is. Why? Even then, but <laughs> the main thing is you should see the whole thing, okay? That you see, here's the beginning, here's the end. If you start making branch bigger, then you can manipulate it that you're reordering logical blocks. And this could do a lot of things, okay? Because you're flattening the control flow in different variations. If I'm sending this input data, then I have a different flow as before, okay? I can do stuff. Homogle of characters, I love it. You see here, these two pages, they are completely different things because I'm in UTF-8 or UTF-16 or whatever, it's not ASCII. So for me, the IDE will show in two terms this H, but if the machine will see it, it will see different characters. So invocation of methods are completely different. If I think it should invoke this one, it would invoke something completely different. Okay, because we are using signs that are nearly the same, the machine will see the difference, but not the human, and the IDE will not highlight it. Okay, but I have something cool. Okay, who of you was at the university studying IT stuff? Computer science, whatever. Okay, anybody of you worked a little bit with compilers? This was mostly the boring part at the university, huh? But it's good if you had it. Bidirectional control flow characters or control characters. What does it mean? I can add this invisible character, the IDE will not highlight it, and it will switch the reading of the compiler from left to right to right to left, and I can activate it. What does it mean is, I would see this in my IDE with the syntax highlighting, here's something, but the machine will read this one completely marked out. Because in the middle, at the right place, I have to switch the direction. The compiler will read the source code. Ouch. This is a very easy example, but you can do it a little bit more tricky so that you're really activating, deactivating parts of lines and you have a complete different source code. This is a little bit more advanced obfuscating technique, but with a code review, no chance. Okay. The only thing what is mostly a little bit suspicious if you're mixing, commenting out, commenting in stuff. Yeah. This is always something you should be aware of. Yeah. No. Okay. Then mostly use commenting stuff just per line, not this blocks, because you have no control what's going in, especially if it's in marked with as documentation and all this stuff. Okay. This is why I'm personally using just slash slash or not this. Uh, to mark blocks. This can be done in different languages. This here, no C, but um, can be done with every language. Okay, these are just a few topics stretching on top of this stuff so that you're aware that on your daily base, working with source code, you should be aware of this stuff, okay? Because it's happening, it's ongoing. Open source projects, inside companies, Research jeffrock.com, you will find a bunch of information about this one. I'm just preparing, um, I think I will start in one or two weeks with an educational track about cybersecurity stuff. I'm really going step by step through different things that will be published on YouTube so that you have what this, what that, what's going on, and so on. More in detail. Yeah? What the best safety belt you have? TDD. It's a general purpose weapon against compliance issues malicious code packages, vulnerabilities, quality, performance, why? If I have a malicious component, I have to grab it and replace with a semantic equal implementation. Okay, if I have a vulnerability, I have to change the bunch of versions of all dependencies, even if they are an intransitive dependency somewhere deep in the inheritance tree or dependency tree. If I have to fight against bugs or if I uh, vulnerabilities, I need a good test coverage. So what I mentioned is use something that is stronger than line coverage or branch coverage because it's weak compared to mutation test coverage. Think about using mutation test coverage to make a really strong, hard test coverage because then you can just switch dependencies and so on and so on and make sure that you're killing vulnerabilities as fast as possible. 
changing the composition of versions of the same dependencies, let it run, push it to production. Okay, you need something that's fully automated. So a very effective dependency management has the highest input for security, quality, speed, feature improvement, all this stuff. Okay. And this is where every software developer is working constantly with. Make sure that this is automated, that it's strong. There is an executive order of cybersecurity, it's called. A bunch of um, people will hear about it if they are delivering to US. It means after the SolarWind tech, the US um, president gave this executive order. I'm not a citizen of US, so I had no clue what's an executive order. Let's say it like this. The US government is like a company and Mr. President is a CEO. What he is able to do is he can change every process inside the company, but he's not allowed to change the law. Okay? And he has done it. And one thing is, after the SolarWinds hack, that he says, okay, every component must now fulfill. That is, owned, run, used, whatever, by the US government, and they're using a lot of software. Must fulfill this s -bomb, the software builds of material. Okay? The software builds of material is more or less a full ingredients list of all components over the whole tech stack, with version, number, artifact, group ID, fingerprints, all this stuff. You can generate this stuff quite easily. But at Artifact or at JFrog, we created built info years ago before this was fancy. And built info is a superset of SBOM. Why I'm saying a superset is useful? SBOM will just give you the full ingredients list, but it will give you no idea or no information about how this was done. Let's think about you want to cook something. If I'm just giving all ingredients and say, here, can you cook a cake or whatever? No. You need all the tiny information in which order, why, how, temperature, all this stuff you need to identify why this cake is bad. I use all the components, okay? And build info is exactly this. You can store all this. You can do it on your laptop in the CI environment, whatever. You can store information about um, the dependencies, environment variables, uh, the libraries, date, time, agent name, whatever you want. Okay. This is stored in Art Factory. And then we have an immutable part and an immutable part. The immutable part is what's not changing anymore. The dependencies, environment variables. The mutable part is a vulnerability database. So if I'm creating now a binary, everything is green, I'm pushing it to production. The next day, the vulnerability database may be updated and then it would be red. How to identify this because it was green yesterday. With this built info, I can just check every new day in the team. Okay, everything we created yesterday is still green, yes or no, without scanning production. And then you see who's using my binaries. Okay. And the good thing with built info is you can compare two builds. So I have the context of creating a binary. And then I have binary one and binary two. And if I'm comparing now the build information, I can see, oops, the only difference was that this binary was built on build agent three and there was this tiny change in the, I don't know, operating system library, whatever. So you can see something like, oh, I have so many build agents, but something is flaky. Oh yeah, it's always build agent three. How to identify it if you have just an S bomb, okay? So build info is a very powerful thing to catch the context of creating binaries. So we have different areas where you should, should go through. Application libraries misuse. If you're checking the security information, for example, for a library in, in X-Ray, yeah? you're checking there and then you see, oh, if you're invoking this library with this method, then it's insecure. Do it like, like another way. Good example, look for JShell. Huh? If you have it just as a dependency, it's one thing, but it depends on the configuration and the usage. It's the same with libraries. If you have IO and all this stuff, sometimes just a matter of how you're invoking or what method you're invoking. Contextual analysis is more or less a field where you try to identify, okay, I have here a vulnerability, but the configuration of the operating system is just closing this port. So it's an active vulnerability, but it's not usable. Okay, so I have a little bit more time. I need to identify which component or which vulnerability is applicable. Yeah. IAC security analyzers. The feature what we just released is you have a Terraform script and then check your Terraform script against best practices because you're deploying infrastructure and it makes no sense to have internal use services exposed huh? and all this stuff. Service config security is more or less the same. Have you deactivated all components you don't need? Have you closed all ports? Just open the ports you need and so on and so on. Huh? Secrets detection. I don't know how often I'm identifying internally used 
Docker images for compiling stuff. And in this Docker image, I find in settings XML with user passwords or just uh, some keys or environment variables. Okay, secret detection. Sometimes this stuff is bleeding out into production of Docker images. Great. Okay, then. SBOM is something you should generate even if it's an uh, open source component, because then it's easier for others to reuse your component. Okay, this is its full ingredients of all dependencies. Malicious packages is something you should have an eye on, because there is no database like a um, vulnerability database about uh, malicious packages. Vulnerabilities we spoke about, license we spoke about, operational risk. If you are identifying an open source component and you want to use it, it's good if you have the operational risk. It's a metric how healthy this project is. If I'm using an open source component for the next three years, I want to know how many committers I have, how many commits, how many bugs, how long it will take, a bug is uh, fixed, how often I will get a new version and all this stuff. If I have no clue about this, I have an operational risk. Okay, I need to know how fast normally a bug will be fixed in this open source component if I'm not able to fix it by myself. Okay, that's called under X-ray operational risk. It will get a big metric there. There is something to start reading. It's called Project Salta. It's an open source documentation project under the Linux Foundation. I highly, highly recommend start reading it. Salsa IO. You have two parts here. First of all, it's explaining different attack vectors inside your software supply chain security environment, your software supply chain. And the other thing is that it's um, defining levels. And then you can identify in which level you are and what would be the next good step to increase your security. The Salsa project is a bunch of different security experts worldwide. They try to bring in all the best practices. It's very generic, but it's a very good start to read and I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. I'm not telling too much about this. Now, open source components. We have, going back to this one, here, we have source threads, build threads, and dependency threads. And now there is one thing. If the source code is compromised or not, a machine is not good to identify. Okay, this is something humans should do. Let's assume until this infrastructure source code is stored somewhere, it will be per definition as secure. It's not secure, but per definition secure, okay? Then we can start on an automatic way hardening the whole open source value chain for this part, build threads and dependency threads. How can this be done? This is done by an open source project. The source is donated to the CD Foundation. You want to make a picture? We did. <laughs> okay. There's an open source project called Persia, Persia IO. It's uh, originally started by, by JFrog because we have the knowledge about the whole dependency management stuff here. Yeah? And to harden the open source supply chain is, if you have the possibility to get source code, and this is why it's only for open source projects, not for closed source projects. Yeah? Then with this source code, I want to make sure that my build infrastructure is not compromised and my created binaries are immutable and not rebuilt or faked or compromised, okay? If I'm thinking in a global scale, let's think about a peer-to-peer -peer network so that I have no control about an instance. And even if I'm compromising a part of the network, the rest would identify the change, okay? That's a basic idea, peer-to-peer -peer network. It's scalable or it's, it's robust against attacks. If partially losing the network, the rest will do the work, okay? Peer-to-peer -peer networks has some scaling limitations on the other side with questioning and all this stuff, but in the end, peer-to-peer -peer network. Then <clears throat> assume I have an open source license and I want to make sure that my stuff is built securely. Then I'm giving my coordinates, where's my source code and the commit tag to the Persia network. The Persia network will select randomly three or four different nodes inside the peer-to-peer -peer network. I have no idea which one is selected. They are grabbing the source code and building it, and then they are comparing binaries. If only one binary is one bit different, it will be marked as red, killed, okay? And make sure that the built infrastructure is not compromised. Even if I'm spawning compromised nodes to the Persia network, it's most likely that I'm, for one build, not all of my builds are selected, okay? Distribute hash table and all this stuff, I mean, you know it, huh? 
the whole stuff is documented in a, a blockchain so that you can check what was going on. If now these binaries are created and verified that they are not compromised, then they will be distributed or will be shifted to the distribution layer. Okay, first example. I'm building something without dependencies. Okay, I'm building it, it's green, it's stored. Now someone is building something with me as a dependency. The good thing is the Persia network now, oh, this binary was built in our network, it's verified, it's green. Now I have something that's using this dependency, now the whole track is green. Huh? The stuff that's created and what's consuming. Now I'm building something and using some external library. Then I would say, okay, I'm going to an authorized node like Maven Central, grabbing the binary, it's yellowish because it's not built in my environment. I can't verify the build process, okay? I have no information about it. Then I know which dependency is red or yellow, let's say yellow. Now we found out there's a malicious component that I'm marking one dependency red in the whole network and I'm not able to redo it because it's red. It's inside the blockchain. Then every build that's using this one will immediately get a red flag. Oh, by the way, you're using a dependency that's red, okay? That's a very simple description of this project. There's a little bit more than this, but this is an ongoing thing that tried to harden the whole open source supply chain. Okay. Shift left means what is the earliest or what is a good point for security? If you're looking at DevOps, DevOps is a process writing, uh, coding, building, testing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's a process. Security is a cross-domain topic. What is the right place for security everywhere? So mostly I see that people start coding, adding a dependency, working two or three hours, committing something to CI, will take some minutes, and then the CI would complain, oh, license issue or vulnerability or whatever. Okay, you burned a lot of time and money. It's way easier if you have this information straight inside your IDE. There's a JFrog IDE plugin. You can use with a free tier, with enterprise, whatever. The plugin itself is IntelliJ, Eclipse, whatever you're using. And then if you're adding a dependency, immediately you see the whole dependency tree. And if something is somewhere in this tree, yellow or red, without writing one line of code, you're not wasting time anymore. Okay? That is shift left as early as possible. Get the information. Now I have something red deep in the tree. I can say, okay, exclude, redefining shortest path in Maven with a different version. And now uh, Sven told me TDD, strong test coverage is good, right? Because if you have a strong test coverage, you can easily change somewhere deep in the tree, a JSON or whatever dependency, redeclaring it on top and verify that the functionality is still the same in a way that you can trust it, okay? A strong test coverage is your safety belt. And then immediately you can work on this one. Declaring a dependency, killing vulnerabilities, go. If you're on command line, you're configuring something, you're getting Docker image, you created a Docker image, whatever, you can do the same. On command line, just use the command line. You don't need an IDE or whatever. All the functionality is available via REST API or command line interface as well. Means on command line, I can just scan my fresh created Docker image. What I, I want to try a few things or I'm getting a Docker image or I'm, I'm getting a library or binary, or whatever, scan it on command line, command line. Then you can script it and all this stuff, okay? By the way, this information is then stored in Artifactory under on-demand scanning. If I'm getting a Docker image and how to make sure that's secure, a solution would be stupid if I would push this unknown Docker image to the infrastructure with my rights to get it scanned, to get the feedback, it's infected. Makes no sense, huh? It makes more sense if I'm creating this stuff or I'm getting it on my machine that I'm scanning it here with the full capabilities of X-Ray, getting the red flag and the documentation is stored in an immutable way on Artifactory so that I can discuss with my colleagues without pushing this malicious stuff inside our own network. Makes no sense, okay? You will get this information if you are in X-Ray. For example, there's one interesting thing. If you're clicking here on the CVSS values, who's working with CVSS? 
Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Okay, everybody know, oh, CVSS 10 or 7.5 or whatever. But what does it mean? CVSS, I'm not going into details. We have no time, but we have three metrics. The basic metric, temporal metric, and the environmental metric. Basic metric is more or less the score of the biggest disaster. It's a description of the worst case of this scenario. Okay. Do I need network for this? Do I need a user for this? Whatever. Okay. The temporal metric is describing what is going on over the time. Now I have a page. I don't have a page. It's uh, just a proof of concept or whatever. Okay. And the environmental metric is mostly for people to scale up and down the CVSS value for your environment. For this thing, you need a public network, then you can use a public network to break in. Okay, I have an air gap network, so my CVSS value is way lower. Oh, other way around. Huh? Okay. The environmental metric, mostly nobody knows it. And the second thing is nearly nobody is able to use a CVSS calculator without any bigger accidents. Okay. Because it's not very common. For this, you should use features like contextual analyzers. That's more or less a solution to get around this. But what you need is you need to learn what is a basic metric. What are the components? By the way, my YouTube channel, I have a long thing about explaining it. Yeah. But you should read it because otherwise this numbers makes no sense. And even this is CVSS3, this is CVSS2. Why? What? What is 3.1? It makes sense because it's such an important number and widely used that maybe you should read again about it. Okay. Docker extension, whatever. It's just the next example. So what I want to say here is at whatever place you are, use vulnerability information and security information. If you are just working on Docker desktop, if you're doing command line inside your IDE, in the website, wherever. Okay. Everybody of you is part of the supply chain at a dedicated place. And if everybody of you is just working and fixing a little bit in his area where he's working, it's a huge improvement. Okay. If you see a vulnerability and you can switch version, do it. If you scan your Docker image, you can warn, you can say no, you can change. Okay. Whatever. Everybody is in charge. Everybody. So what can you do next? Well, you can give me a bunch of questions right now, then we are switching you off. I have a bunch of different talks and workshops. You can invite me again, maybe for a secure hacking or so. I want to plan it in March, April. Yeah, then we can do this stuff on free webinars for sure. LinkedIn, if you have questions, don't use emails. Please don't use emails. And um, yeah. Again, my YouTube channel. I love it. My pet project. Okay. So, um, yeah. The theoretical part is done. I will switch off this session so that we are stop recording. And then we can start with questions. Uh, you can ask whatever question because with stop recordings, no information is bleeding out. So my company, my product or whatever. Yeah. So that you are on the secure side. Okay. Then, um, bye bye.